Hello and welcome to Eye on Africa and a very special welcome to our new South African viewers joining us on Open View. I'm James Creedon. These are our headlines from across the continent uh, this evening. In Ivory Coast, opposition and civil society groups demonstrated in Abidjan on Thursday. At least one protester died in clashes. Those protests were against President Alassane Ouattara's decision to run for a third term in October elections. More on that at the top of the show. In Mozambique, a key port in the north of the country remains in the hands of an Islamist group. This according to several sources. The government is denying that it has lost control of Mochimbawa de Praia. We'll get some analysis of that situation. And European holidaymakers, uh, they're a regular feature along the Tunisian coastline every summer. But this year, most hotels and resorts are only barely ticking over. This despite efforts to keep the sector afloat. We'll bring you a report on that later on in the show. Thanks for watching. Now we start in West Africa, where at least one protester was killed in Ivory Coast on Thursday in protests over President Alassane Ouattara's decision to run again for office. Now that recent announcement followed the sudden death of Prime Minister Amadou Gon Koulibaly. He had been set to run instead of Ouattara in upcoming presidential elections. Now though, old wounds have been reopened in Ivory Coast between uh, President Ouattara and his rivals. Nicolas Germain reports. Scenes of violence in Abidjan brought back bad memories to many Ivorians. Ten years ago, the country suffered a bloody post-electoral crisis and tensions are now once again running high. The authorities had banned protests on Thursday, but many still took to the streets. Several people were killed. The opposition does not want Alassane Ouattara to run again in October's presidential election. The Ivorian constitution says no one can do more than two presidential terms. But Ouattara's supporters say that because the constitution was changed in 2016 after his re-election, the clock now has to be reset. Initially, Ouattara, who's 78, had said he would not run again. But the ruling party's candidate, Amadou Gon Koulibaly, died from a heart attack last month, a death that prompted Ouattara to change his decision. Face à ce cas de force majeure et par devoir citoyen, j'ai décidé de répondre favorablement à l'appel de mes concitoyens me demandant d'être candidat à l'élection présidentielle du 31 octobre 2020. Unrest was not limited to Abidjan, but took place in several other towns, including Bonoir in the south and Daoukro in the east. To Mozambique next, an, an intensifying insurgency in the gas-rich northern stretch of the country. Islamist militants have occupied a key port. Uh, Mochimboa de Praia fell to an Islamic State-affiliated group after days of attacks. This, according to several reports. The government has remained tight-lipped about the situation, saying there are ongoing efforts to neutralise terrorists. For more on that situation, I spoke earlier to Dr. Alex Vines at Chatham House Research Institute. I started by asking him about the aims of the jihadist group that has seized the port. They are fairly opaque. They, they have definitely claimed an affiliation with Islamic State. My own view is it's a bit of a flag of convenience. Uh, most of the issues are local. They're not uh, to do with international jihadism. But they do fly black flags and they do say that they are for an Islamic State in the north of Cabo de Gado, uh, which is the province where this crisis is happening. Um, they do seem to be better resourced than they were. They're certainly better motivated and they're better armed even than they were in January. So they have definitely improved their, their, their ability in this insurgency. But I think your, your, your viewers should expect this to ebb and flow. There will be offensives and counter-offensives. The government will recapture Muzimbo de Praia. They're already contesting that the town has fallen. I believe the port probably is in control of the insurgents at the moment. 
but not necessarily the whole town. And, now, just uh, just to right, talk, the third time. just to talk briefly about yep. the, the territory of Mozambique. It's, it's an enormous country. The capital uh, Maputo is in the far, far south, and this is taking place in the distant north. I mean, how much uh, is this to do with si simply the, the the fact that the government is uh, the central government, at least, is very, very far away from uh, the action up here? Would you say that you could make some loose comparisons to the situation in Mali? where a, cap a distant capital is just unable to uh, control some, some stretches of territory very far away? Good question. I think there is core periphery here. I mean, from Maputo to Pemba, the, the provincial capital, is about three hours. Basically, you should have another time zone in, in Cabo de Gado. Uh, Mozambique doesn't do that because it wants to keep uh, uh, the time zone to one country. Uh, and the politics in the far north is... is it's more west, it's more East African than it is Southern African. So comparing uh, Mozimbwa de Praia, uh, which we're talking about with Kidal in Northern Mali is probably not a bad a equivalent. They, they, they are very, very different. Now tell us briefly about the gas resources in the north. I mean, this group surely can't hope to uh, take control of these gas uh, resources and be taken seriously, right? Is that, is that part of their aim or is it just more to undermine the government? It's more to undermine the, uh, undermine the government. Uh, there, there have been some attacks of, of convoys going to the gas uh, um, enclave of Afunji, which is not far from Mazimbo de Praia, uh, but that's almost collateral damage. It's not direct at Afunji. Uh, obviously, for, for, for French viewers, it, it's significant because Total is the, 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 the main player now for the Area 1 gas development in Afunji. Um, so I think what we're going to see is a enclave gas development that is very well protected, that has a hardened airstrip that the contractors and everybody fly into that protected area, and that outside that compound you have increasing insecurity, which is what we're seeing. France's Prime Minister Jean Castex will lead a commemoration ceremony on Friday to honour six French aid workers killed in an ambush shooting at a giraffe reserve outside of Niger's capital, Niamey. France is now discouraging its citizens uh, to, from travelling to the country. Uh, two local Nigerian guides were also killed in the attack, one of whom was a con conservationist, Kadri Adou. Our colleagues at France 2 went to meet his friends and family. He was a well-known face in the village of Kouré. Kadri Abdou, a conservationist in a nearby park, was taking a group of French aid workers on a tour along with his fellow Nigerian driver, Boubacar Gaba, his family, and his colleagues remember him dearly. C'est un grand homme, un conservateur, vraiment qui a œuvré tout son temps avant sa disparition dans la conservation des dernières girafes de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Many here say the Kure Giraffe Reserve was one of the few remaining tourist sites in Niger, owing to its reputation as one of the less dangerous spots in the country. Yet it was in the reserve that the attack took place and that the group's car was later found, torched and riddled with bullet holes. Gadri's colleagues are not only mourning his death, they're also worried about their future. They fear their efforts over the past years to attract tourists who provided an income for nearby villages could now be wasted. Les guides qui sont là, c'est une activité qu'ils ont. Et maintenant, ils ont perdu leur activité. Il faut que cela aussi, l'État essaie de voir qu'est-ce qu'on pourra faire pour les guides. Since the shooting, France's foreign ministry has issued a travel warning against visiting Niger. It's now classified all of the country with the exception of its capital Niamey, as a so-called red zone. Up until now, the Kouré Giraffe Reserve was considered a yellow zone, a lower limited risk area. To Tunisia next, where the tourism sector is reeling due to the knock-on effects of COVID-19, 400,000 Tunisians work in tourism. It makes up 14% of the GDP. And despite uh, the reopening of borders in June and the easing of other restrictions, the numbers of foreign tourists visiting are a fraction of what they once were. Lila Blez and Hamdi Talili report. At this hotel in the seaside city of Hamamet, the staff have had to completely update their hospitality protocol because of the COVID-19 crisis. It starts at the reception. C'est utilisation de gel partout, distanciation, un mètre et demi, que ce soit à la reception, uh, autour des piscines, sur la plage. 
Tunisian hotels are only allowed to book out half their rooms, but this establishment can only fill 20% of them. Its few clients are Tunisians or French, like this group of friends who have come to Tunisia for the first time. On a fait du quad, on a fait le bateau pirate, et à chaque fois, encore hier, au bateau pirate, prise de température. Non, franchement, vraiment très très bien organisé. Laure, who's been coming to Tunisia for almost 30 years, came looking for calm beaches. During the week, they're practically empty. J'ai préféré cet été venir ici plutôt que sur les plages françaises, parce que les plages françaises sont bondées. On aurait été les uns à côté des autres, et moi, ça, par contre, j'avais très peur de ça. The hospitality sector's revenues fell by more than half at the end of July, the worst hit to tourism since the 2015 mass shooting. It's a crisis, and it's very difficult, and we don't know yet the reprise. It's going to be for when. A recovery is also badly needed for medical tourism. In this clinic in Tunis, the vast majority of patients in 2019 were foreigners, but this year they only make up 35% of clients. The stage is dedicated to the chirurgy in general. Normalement, euh, il doit être plein. Nous avons 21 lits dans cet étage. Aujourd'hui, dû aux circonstances de Covid, euh, la clinique est presque vide. Since the borders reopened, some French people have been able to come for plastic surgery, but only in limited numbers. A huge blow for a sector that was growing before the pandemic. All right, that's all for this edition of Eye in Africa. Thanks for watching. It was produced by Fraser Jackson, and thanks to him and all the team.